in the chaos of Iraq. They rely on bravery, loyalty, and yes, on luck. But what happens when luck turns to sacrifice? If I live, I was gonna lose my leg. The men and women. One, two, three, let's... The medics. The pilots. The doctors and nurses who every day put others' lives ahead of their own. A Navy surgeon saved his life. It's a race to save the wounded warriors. The firefights. The car bombs. The improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. The wounding of US troops. So begins their medical journey home. Amidst the chaos, the pain, Army medics or Navy corpsmen take life-saving action. The fight continues around them. This is the first level of treatment. They bandage the fallen, carry them out. If the battle's too hot for a medevac helicopter, it's into vehicles nearby then on to a fallback position out of the kill zone. This is triage, the next level of care. One, two, three, go. Navy shock and trauma platoon members collect and clear the wounded. The goal, stabilize the patient and send back to battle, or on to the next level of treatment. Urgent, 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 urgent. urgent means medical evacuation. If the patient can be delivered to a combat field hospital within one hour of being wounded, What's called the golden hour, odds are he'll survive. In the middle of the Iraqi desert, there is no LZ, no landing zone. A purple smoke grenade guides this helicopter in. The clock is ticking. It's time for the medicine man. Medicine man, that's the call sign for the US Army medevac unit. Two pilots, a crew chief, and a flight medic in each Black Hawk. Guys in the field will get injured in, during their battles, and their medics on the scene can only treat them uh, to a certain extent. Our job is to grab them and pick them up and bring them to a hospital. The they get the call on the radio. Stop by us, and pick those guys up. Yeah, we can do that. Fire up the bird. The clock is still ticking. We fly at a pretty high uh, speed with impatience. Care begins in flight. They're brought to the CASH Combat Support Hospital or to a forward surgical team and turned over to the surgeons. Medevac crews do this all day, all night. You know, I try and think of myself in their, in their shoes. I'm injured, I'm hurting, maybe I'm bleeding. My life is in danger, possibly. I know that uh, my medic's tried his best and can only do so much. And then you hear the aircraft coming in that will take you out of there, the freedom bird, so to speak, and bring you to the hospital and, and fix you there. That's what happened to Lieutenant Colonel Timothy Maxwell. He got the call that's a uh, uh, litter urgent. A Marine injured, in and out of consciousness. Picked him up, he'd had a mortar explode near him. He had shrapnel all through his left side. He had a fractured left leg and a possible fracture in his left arm. As I make sure all the bleeding still stop, and I just manage his airway and monitor his vitals all the way back to the cache. They made it within the golden hour to the next level of care. That's a good feeling, though, when you can get a guy out and within uh, 20 minutes, he's out of hospital. It's just great. Next, the medevac team races to a shock and trauma platoon near the front lines of Fallujah. There, we meet 19-year-old Lance Corporal Chris Allen in Iraq one month. I got hit by an RPG. I got shrap metal in it and in my leg. And the last thing I remember is just sitting on a corner providing security. And I just heard a boom. The next thing I know, I just felt pain. Before, I wasn't scared of going out there until that happened. When I've heard the explosions, they've went off by me before. But that was actually the closest one where I could feel the heat and everything actually hit me. 
and that was pretty scary. The surgeons say Chris's wounds are treatable and decide to keep him here, so the helicopter takes off without him. Anytime you put a patient on a helicopter, they're, they're at risk uh, to uh, fire from the ground. Anything that we can treat here definitively, we will. The risk, the medevac helicopter being shot down, like this one. We've been fired at uh, probably more times than we can count. Per Geneva Convention, medevacs must travel unarmed. Then around uh, flying by an aircraft as it was shot down by a heat-seeking missile, uh, that was probably the most unnerving feeling I felt uh, to date. Terrorists really don't care. They just shoot whatever's flying. Evasive maneuvers, all they can do. Translation, fancy flying. We get small arms fire. We see it at night. During the daytime, we don't see it. So for us, we don't know if we're getting fired on half the time. They fly as low as 10 feet. We try not to think about that and try and think about getting the patient out of there as fast as we can. Despite danger, Flight Medic Sergeant Melinda Gates must treat her patients. It's usually my crew that lets me know that we've been shot at or that there's burning vehicles or rockets or something. I, I really don't notice that. I'm more focused on the patients and getting them in the aircraft, getting them treated. We land near Karbala and follow Sergeant Gates to a forward surgical team. Two 19-year-old Marines, PFCs Randy Nichols and Frank Robinson, were patched up here after taking fire. So I was hit, shot twice in the leg, and I caught some shrapnel in the arm. I had a... Uh, Ran out of ammo, so I got back in, tried to get more. I turned around and get out, and I got hit with a bullet in the shoulder. Randy and Frank are loaded onto litters to go to the next level of care. When I was laying on the side of the road, and they were bandaging me up there, that's when I kind of got the reality check of everything. I was thinking, wow, I'm actually human again, and things do happen, and you can't get hurt. Sergeant Gates monitors their vitals. The medical care has come so far in the past few years, and guys like that may have died from infection or something like that. The two privates are delivered to the Cash Combat Support Hospital, Baghdad. Sergeant Gates hands them over to the doctors. They've made it to the ER. Uh, where'd you get shot? In the leg. In the leg. For now, medevac mission accomplished. Coming up, life and death at the Combat Support Hospital. He's in tough shape. He's in the fight of his life. We continue with the wounded warriors on their medical journey. Welcome to the cash. Combat Support Hospital, Baghdad inside the green zone. Came off the helicopter, he didn't have a heart uh, rhythm at all. He's pulseless, and he was shot in the head. Army specialist Mark Spears takes over CPR from the flight medic. You do chest compressions to uh, circulate blood, hopefully restore a pulse. This is the ER. Unlike the TV show, it's real. We're done, there's nothing we can do to help. All too real for 23-year-old Spears. We keep track of um, all the Americans who died on our shift while we work. All the little dots are American soldiers who were killed here in Iraq. He also marks the attacks on his hospital. I used to keep track of how many times we got bombed with lines, but we get bombed a lot more and we get dots. And I've probably been around like 10 times if I kept track of that. Green Zone's a pretty big target for the Iraqis. They like to shoot ass. We've had a couple of mortar rounds hit the hospital, but. As you can see, it's pretty well fortified. It's always in the back of your mind. You know, every time you go outside, a mortar round can hit right by you and kill you. There's nothing you can do about it. We try to do our job the best we can and hope for the best. Point attack times three hours, head injury, right hand, and right leg. For doctors like Captain Sudeep Bose, the work here is raw, dirty, gut wrenching. I mean, most of them are explosive sort of injuries, like improvised explosive devices or car bombs or bombs and anything, basically, soda cans, cars, you know, dead animals, whatever. Blood and the gut, you're kind of trained for that as a doctor, and you're ready for it. But what's different here is there's another level of attachment to your patients, which are the soldiers, because you know they're, they're like all of us. They left the States. They're hoping to go back. And the wounded keep coming and coming. 
we try to save everybody who comes in. So, I mean, of course it's frustrating when we lose people, but um, you get a little comfort in the fact that we save a lot more people than we lose. It never gets easier, just part of the job. They bring in a patient and they're hanging on to life. We're ready for it. One of those patients hanging on is a soldier in intensive care, far from home, far from family. We're all we've got. Nobody goes home, ever. So, you know, as long as he's here, we're gonna be here with him. Squad leader Jason Moore is talking about his sergeant, Andy Brown, in a coma. Heading out, you know, normal patrols. He's out looking for the bad guys, trying to, you know, keep it safe for uh, the airport and, you know, hit an IED, and it was a bad one. They had one waiting for us, and it went off. It, uh, it did a lot of damage to the vehicle. It, the vehicle doesn't even exist anymore. It looked like the vehicle had just been messed with with a kid with a can opener. But uh, we got got him out. Um, actually had to take another Humvee and rip the doors off with a chain because um, they were blown inside the vehicle. From the time of the blast, it only took 15 minutes to get Andy to the cache. Andy's nurse, Major Lisa Snyder, is tending to his wounds while his buddies hover. I mean, they really literally saved his life um, when he first came in here as far as giving the blood that he needed because otherwise he would have died. Andy's doctor, Colonel Cindy Claggett. They can't really do anything else except worry, fret, pray, and give blood, and, and they're, I mean, they're here 24 hour a day vigil. They're sleeping in corners on the floor or not sleeping more often than not. Um, they barely have time to eat. They know he's in a coma, but they lean down and, uh, and talk to him. They touch him. It's Andy's band of brothers. We donate blood or whatever. We do whatever we can possibly, you know, to support him. He's just like a brother to us. So we know that he would do the same for us, and we're going to do all we can to help him. He's in tough shape. He's in the fight of his life. He'd be what I call as critically ill as anybody could possibly get. Days later, 22-year-old Sergeant Andy Brown died, but not alone. And even when things started to look like they were just not, just not going to be able to turn around for him, his unit still, they kind of stood a vigil. And again, these were guys who, in their regular job, have to go out and be on patrol and, and, and get shot at and face the same injuries that this kid did. Even though he's here, half a world away from his, his family, um, he had a family with him. Coming up. Most of the time, you know, we're under attack. We all stop what we're doing just because this attack is going on. We'll show you the fight to save lives in the most dangerous place on Earth. At the Air Force Theater Hospital, Balad Air Base, Marine Corporal Chris Fesmeyer is taken off the medevac. A mine took both his legs. He's rushed into ER. He's conscious. Fesmeyer, Although Chris made it through the golden hour, hey, X -ray, X -ray. this will be his second operation since wounded just five hours ago. The uh, Navy surgeons at that Fort Operating Base saved his life. And uh, believe it or not, he's quite fortunate uh, to, to be here with us. In the OR, alarm red, incoming. We're under attack by mortars or rockets. And this is the most frequently attacked base in Iraq. Despite that, surgeons continue working on Chris. We've built up as best we can around those operating theaters with uh, big concrete barriers and sandbags and, and that sort of thing. So uh, still an alarm red. <laughs> Those folks that aren't 
scrubbed in in sterile gear uh, do have the opportunity, if they can get to their gear safely, put on a helmet or flank vest. We don't stop what we're doing just because um, this attack is going on. Chris, you're doing great, buddy. Chris, you're doing great. Chris is then taken to ICU, where we meet up again with Lieutenant Colonel Tim Maxwell. He's in critical condition, in and out of consciousness. Alarm red again. It means that there's imminent danger. Um, most of the time, you know, we're under attack. Maxwell's nurse stays by his side. You can't leave them because they're critical patients. So you have to stay at the bedside and go ahead and perform your duties just like, you know, if you were not in a code red. Yeah, this is heavy and it's hot. and. Uh, and I can't wait to get out of it because it hurts my back. Alarm red, finally over. But their work here today has just begun. Baghdad is bringing two, two helicopters full. Full of casualties from two bombs exploding in Baghdad's green zone. Just take a deep breath. You know what you got to do. Manpower, roll them into the ER as we need be, as we deem it critical or not critical, and then we'll go from there, OK? Right. Everybody ready? The medevacs arrive. Patient after patient. This is what's called a mass casualty. The medevacs bring more. And more. And they race to the ER. Air Force medic Sergeant Jacqueline Horton tries to ease them. Well, when they come in, off the chopper especially, they're disoriented. And we tell them over and over again that we're going to stay with you, that you're not alone. Remind them that we're there with them and ask them if they need more for pain. We tell them exactly what we're doing to them so that there's no surprises um, because of the fear, the magnitude of the fear that they're experiencing, the unknown. As that's the only comforting thing that those parents back home have is to think that somebody is over here talking to them. That comforting personal attention is evident at the next level of care, too. Lower, lower. The CASIF, Contingency Aeromedical Staging Facility. We're like a medical air terminal. For the wounded, this is the last stop in Iraq. Prepare to lift, lift. Prepare to lower, lower. Make sure that he's even on this litter. Get him here, we get him medicated, and get him comfortable. Here, we meet Gunnery Sergeant Mel Greer, shot in the leg, ambushed in the dangerous city of Ramadi. Basically, from my ankle down, I can't feel my foot whatsoever. This is his platoon under fire. We were out on a vehicle patrol and stopped to do a vehicle checkpoint, and we had some insurgents come around a corner and uh, open up with automatic weapons and small fires. And this is Mel's combat video. Gunny, he's, he's uh, hitting the right leg. Automatic weapons fire. It's you know less than a tenth of a second between rounds. It hit my pistol and hit my leg, uh, knocked me down, and Hell's Fury just unleashed. <laughs> there it goes. Good shot. He's taken fire countless times. Just that night prior, I'd only gotten about three hours of sleep in the last 30 hours. We'd uh, gone out for a security run and the bus car got hit by three IEDs and then small arms fire. And then uh, less than 12 hours later, we were right back out and got hit again. So, being aggressive. Mel and other patients must wait here for the next plane out of country. I'm saying it. Tech Sergeant George Denby, an emergency medic for 18 years, checks on them. You need a blanket or anything? All right. He works closely with Master Sergeant Nancy Peck, an emergency medic for 21 years. It's hard, even for these seasoned vets. They just pull at your heartstrings. <laughs> They're sacrifice. They're humble. They, they don't want to go back home. They want to go back to the fight, back to the unit. Some of these patients that we get here, they, they haven't bathed in days. They've eaten out of a box. Um, they, they don't have pillow to sleep on. The medics try everything to keep them comfortable. <laughs> We 
we have some patients, so some pretty serious patients right next, and you're right next to another patient. So not only are you worried about your own problems, but you're worried about the guy next to you. So we try to do everything we can to keep them, uh, keep their minds off of that. The singing doesn't tempt PFC Matthew Solberg. The 19-year-old Marine has trouble speaking after an IED exploded near him. We're kind of used to that stuff after being here for a while. You just kind of get over it and do your job. Then, alarm red, incoming. In the middle of all this, more wounded arrive. Among them, Lance Corporal Chris Allen, injured by a rocket-propelled grenade near Fallujah. Like all patients, Chris is checked for hidden explosives. Then, checked medically. I'm doing pretty good. Much better. I saw you guys the first time. But flashbacks are bothering him. Yeah, all the time. Usually when I'm sleeping, it comes back here. The touches of home here, courtesy of the medics, help Chris. Little flag's cool. I love this one. This is going to be with me all the time now. So whenever I get down, I can just think of it and realize what I'm fighting for. And a little picture says thank you. Coming up, the race against time. Yeah, we have about 65 patients for seven people to take care of. We have to keep them alive because we can have the best doctors back home. If we can't take them there, they can't do anything for them back home. A rare inside look at the plane that will take them out of Iraq. Care of, so we'll be busy tonight. But the patients will be glad to go home. This is for emergency oxygen. Yeah. This isn't even our job yet. <laughs> it's part of our job. It's part of our job. Yeah. Healthcare Good providers, slash <laughs> construction <laughs> workers. Back at the CASIF or medical air terminal, or lift, lift. the patients, like Gunny Sergeant Mel Greer, are ready to go. My country will take care of me no matter what. Oh, got it. Okay. Prepare. Lift. Lift. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Good job, guys. Past the tank barriers and on to the next level of care, the plane. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. The flight medics are now ready. Hopefully I'll return to my Marines. My wife probably doesn't want to hear that. Litter patients like Mel first. Thank you, sir, for your service. We really appreciate it. Move. Good luck. Oh, Mike Mia, we're going to rack them. One, one, ready, rack. Watch his foot. Watch his foot. Watch his foot. Thank you. You all right, Mel? Doing good, bud. Next, ambulatories like PFC Matthew Solberg. Matthew has a speech problem from a head injury. Then, Lance Corporal Chris Allen, hit by an RPG. Chris needs a little help boarding. Last on, critical patients from intensive care. Marine Corporal Chris Fesmeyer, a mine took both his legs. Chris is coming straight from surgery. Then, Lieutenant Colonel Tim Maxwell, who took shrapnel to the head from a mortar. Maxwell was in the ICU during Alarm Red. One, two, three. You look at some of these injuries, it just punch you right in the stomach. You just, so you feel sorry, but, you, but you're happy that they're getting out of here. You know, you're happy for them, okay, they're going, you know, they're, they're closer to seeing their families and going home. This is the last thing the wounded warriors will see in Iraq. The plane goes dark for tactical takeoff. This is light discipline, only low red light until we clear Iraqi airspace. For those who can, vest and helmet in case of incoming fire. This is hostile territory. The tactical takeoff spirals to avoid any ground fire, hurts Matthew's head. The flight medics go to work. Using chemical glow sticks or tiny lights, 
They squeeze between patients and litters. Cargo light shines briefly in back. Matthew uses it to climb into a litter to rest his head. After clearing a rocky airspace, lights on. Chris also tries to get comfortable. Heavy flak vests come off. Mel's restless. Medics are working on patients beside and above him, climbing up the stacks of litters around him. He worries they'll step on his injured leg and foot. Accidentally, they do. It's difficult work under difficult conditions. I have to keep them alive because we can have the best doctors back home if we can't take them there and keep them alive on the way. They can't do anything for them back home. About six hours later, touchdown. Ramstein Air Base, Germany. The patients are offloaded. Chris looks around at the rain, the cold. You ready to move? Move. Just gotta keep them in here, but out there in the wet. Got it? Got it? Okay. Matthew wakes up. And Mel is tucked in against the freezing temperatures. Okay, move, move. Next stop, Landstuhl Regional Medical Center, the next level of care. They arrive at the biggest military hospital outside the U.S. How you doing, Mel? Good day. Mel is headed straight to more surgery. Next, Matthew. And in socks, his boots still in a rock, Chris. In the OR, Mel is prepped. The surgeon scrubs in. He examines Mel's leg wounds. The speed through all the levels of care from the battlefield helped. And our airbag system right now is, is unbelievable. You, we hear what happens in the news pretty much, and you know, within 24 to 48 hours, these guys are getting getting into our hospital, and, uh, and we're having to take care of them. And, uh, Half hour later. Hey, Gunny, open your eyes. Can you open your eyes? Hey, we're all done, bro. We're all done. You did great. Gunny, do you have any pain right now? Chris, meanwhile, is getting his wounds cleaned. They've already done an x-ray after. They, they took it out to make sure all the shrapnel is, because sometimes shrapnel is left in, in people, and actually it does more harm to go into it to get it than it does to get it. And a lot of times, like again, the body will push it out on its own. So. Mel rolls in. How's your pain, Gunny? Yeah. Hey, hey. Even groggy, he's still a Marine. Thank you, sir. Thanks for riding. They took off the little splint that was down there today so I can actually play with my foot a little bit. But Mel still has no feeling in his foot. We'll see if doctors at the next level of care can do anything about that. It's amazing. You know, I was hit on Saturday, and, and to each level of care that I've, I've moved out to is, you know, I think it's Tuesday now, and it's, I've already had a second surgery. I've already been taken care of. I've already been clean. You know, I'm, I'm in Germany, and I'm getting ready to go home, you know, already. It's, it's just amazing. When we return, coming home. I still have no feeling below my knee. I cannot uh, move my foot. Is it frustrating for you that you were at a desk and not preparing for battle? The reality of war sets in. Lieutenant Colonel Tim Maxwell took shrapnel to the head after a mortar attack. He was in the ICU during Alarm Red. One month later, Maxwell is at the VA hospital in Richmond, Virginia. He's doing physical and speech therapy. I don't remember much, but I was a little bit awake, I think about 18 minutes or so, not very long. But they did a good job of getting us fixed up and flown away. His goal, get back to racing triathlons. 
I can do them. The question is, can I still do them as fast? <laughs> I can do them, I'm sure. Another Iron Man, Corporal Chris Fesmeyer. A mine took both his legs. Surgeons operated on him at Balad Air Base. He's good. <sighs> then Chris was sent to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. During therapy, Chris shares for the first time what happened when his Humvee hit the mine. And as I was like up like this, I could, my legs were just dangling down like a rag doll. Yeah, I did. And I knew that, I knew from there that if I lived, I was, you know, I was gonna lose my leg. That was probably the biggest fight was just to live because I could feel myself, all the blood leaving my body through my legs. It was like, it was just, just draining out of me. So at that point, you know, I tried to hold on to somebody's hand and I just, I knew I was gonna, I knew I was gonna die, but just thought to myself, you know, there's a lot of things I have to live for. And uh, I couldn't, I couldn't die in that, in that place. Chris plans to get out of the core, get a PhD and teach English. I gotta keep myself doing really well in order to walk again, because that's what I want more than anything else. The other Chris, Lance Corporal Chris Allen, was injured near Fallujah. I got hit by an RPG. Chris made it back to Camp Pendleton, California, as did Private First Class Matthew Solberg. I don't really remember much. That was right after his head injury. Matthew's speech is now back to normal. And remember PFC's Randy Nichols and Frank Robinson? They were shot in a firefight near Karbala. We never expected to be invited to Randy's wedding. Randy, will you have Amanda to be your wedded wife? I will. This, the day right before Randy reported back to Camp Lejeune. You may kiss your bride. <laughs> and finally, Gunnery Sergeant Mel Greer. Mel had leg surgery in Germany. Then, more surgery here at the Naval Hospital at Camp Pendleton. Gunny is going to tilt your chin up. Good. Take some nice deep breaths for me. Mel's had 10 operations since coming home. He still has nerve damage in his foot. There's nothing you can do because his nerve's intact. It's just been, uh, it's not been transected. It's just been severely bruised by the injury from the AK-47. Afterwards. I also feel guilty that I'm not back in Iraq with my Marines that are out there. It's very hard, you know, trying to sit here and, and realize that, hey, I'm okay, but what about my Marines and what about the Marines, all of the Marines in Iraq? You know, it's, it's tough. Hatch, tell us, One year later, I catch up with Mel Greer as his Marines retrain for Iraq. He won't be going with them. I still have no feeling below my knee. I cannot uh, move my foot. He walks with a cane. I sit in an office environment now. My legs get cramped and, and muscles get, um, you know, tired. It's just a long, painful day. Mel's pushing the training of these Marines forward, even though he's now in the background. I know that you are happy that you are still in the Marine Corps and that you still have a role, but is it frustrating for you that you were at a desk and not preparing for battle? It, I, it's not so frustrating that uh, I can't be a part of it. I'm just not doing what I want to do. It's tough. It's really hard just to be a part of it, but not go forward and do it all. Shut up. How does that feel? So Mel gets counseling for post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm willing to retrain so they can stay in. I don't want to feel like, uh, you know, a tissue. I want some use and throw away. You know, it's just, and I look at my wife, and uh, I'm supposed to provide for her in our retirement and our future. And now she's doing more for me than I'm doing for her. From where we met you in the tent mm -hmm. to the going on the medevac, to this whole process, what is it that is important for people to be aware of? All of it, just like we're doing. You know, we're showing them what really happens. It's just, uh, you're not shot and then you're better the next day, as Hollywood wants to make it happen. 
and it takes years to recover. It can take a lifetime to recover for some people. It's a big, a big process that goes with it and you gotta take care of yourself as well as others. Despite medical breakthroughs, not all warriors will make it home. In my heart and in my mind, I realize everyone did everything they possibly could. Lieutenant Colonel Tim Maxwell, little more than one year ago, traumatic brain injury. Don't know what Maxwell happened. today at Camp Lejeune. So my wife was told in the hospital that I probably would never get up. He's come a long up, way said, since I saw him in Iraq after a mortar attack. Even convincing the brass to let him open a barracks for wounded warriors where they can help each other heal. This place, these barracks, Maxwell Hall for the wounded warriors. Is this maybe the last level of care as these wounded warriors get home, it's something for them to move on? It is, we, the transition from being in your unit, being wounded, put through hospitals, and then phasing either back to their original unit or phasing back to the civilian world, this would be the last stop. Here, they get counseling, eat, sleep, and deal with change of life issues together. Once we were injured, we all had something in common. Like Navy Corpsman Joseph Rowe, or Doc, who was first on the scene to treat Maxwell after the mortar attack. He had an injury and I saw his brain. I mean, I was patching him up. Not long after we saw him help carry Maxwell's stretcher to the next level of care, a roadside bomb turned Doc into a patient too. All the frag and everything hit my right side. Injured, he now works here with Maxwell. You're the guy that helped save his life in Iraq, and now the two of you are trying to help other wounded warriors with this barracks. I think this could possibly be the final level, that once they go through all that and all the stress. And all the recovery. And all the recovery and all the, all the work they do for themselves and the echelons of care, now they can come here and relax and heal. Healing takes time. Maxwell still goes to speech therapy. What is that, what is that called? I forget. To help find the right words. Wedding pie. No, 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 no. There's wedding cake. Mm -hmm. Wedding cake. Correct. A year after being injured, it's difficult for his family, too. I want to thank everyone for coming. So his wife, Shannon, to... started a support group um, for spouses tonight, like herself. Well, we'll... Then we can talk about those issues. We've had to adapt to Tim's disabilities. The largest thing we try and get through is, is the uncertainty. I would say that the families and the wives, in particular mine and, and most of the others, they have it worse than I did, and no question. Their children have witnessed dad's progress and recent seizures. It was kind of scary because we didn't know what would happen. What if something bad happens? What if he dies? I mean, what if he dies in the night? It's, it was just scary. And they have advice for other kids whose moms or dads come home hurt. I would say, hey, he's gotten injured. I know, I know how it feels. My dad did too, but um, he's going to get better. Just know that that's your dad and you should be proud of him because he risked his life to go out there and that, you should be proud of that. A smart response. And they're proud of what he's doing now, opening the first wounded warriors barracks in America. These kids go home, there's nobody around to talk to. Your family doesn't understand. Your friends, you know, from back home don't understand. We do. No matter if you're Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines. Once you've been hurt and you're a wounded warrior, you understand. Maybe this happened to me on purpose. I'm not a very religious guy, but maybe, maybe I got wounded so I would do this for a living. I don't know. We all know, you know, what it, what it feels like to be wounded what it feels like to come home, and this is our home. Not all we met in Iraq made it home alive. They always made it very clear to us that he was very, very critical. 
we met Sergeant Andy Brown at the Combat Support Hospital in Baghdad. Despite the efforts of his surgeons and his unit standing by and giving blood, Andy lost the fight. His parents, Bill and Lords Brown. We were really crushed that we couldn't be there with him. And they, the men took turns and they stayed with him the whole time. And he was, ne he was never alone. And that meant a great deal to us. Since they couldn't be there, we shared our video of their son's last hours. We're all we've got. And without, nobody goes alone, ever. So, you know, as long as he's here, we're gonna be here with him. Even though he's here, half a world away from his, his family, um, he had a family with him, and that he was incredibly cared for um, by virtually everybody that, that, that was around him. I know he was well taken care of. It was good to see it. In my heart and in my mind, I realized everyone did everything they possibly could. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, people don't forget our men in uniform and our women in uniform and all the people who are there with them, fighting with them and helping support them. It's not just the soldiers, it's the doctors, the nurses, the, the Red Cross. It's also the medics, the air crews, an entire military operation trying to get each patient to the next level of care. Trying to get each wounded warrior home. <laughs>